Welcome to another lively edition of The Deadly Experiment on public access television in Rhode Island and also on uh, the YouTube channel under the name The Deadly Experiment. Folks, uh, we're living, as I said on every program recently, that we're living in times of crises, times when the world is rocking, nation is raising itself against nation, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Now that word kingdom, does that mean King uh, Abdul Huzan of, uh, of uh, Arabia? It means Christ's kingdom or God's kingdom is rebelling against Satan's kingdom on the earth. Kingdom against kingdom, but nation against nation. And those nations also make up the nations that God has created in the book of Genesis, from the African nations to the Asian nations to the brown races to all of the different races that existed way before the European, white, Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian peoples of the Bible. You heard me right. All of them were created at different times. All of them. God is not a fool. He does not make nonsense. He makes perfect sense. But to hear pastors and preachers and prophets today, as they call themselves, prophecy experts speak, you wouldn't know it, would you? You would think that somehow the Bible is just a book of fairy tales and a book of, of just, you know, carnal knowledge, as some people would put it, uh, a book of, uh, of mystery and a book that's pretty nice to look at for prose and, you know, for poetry and, and all of that. But it's not God's Word. It doesn't explain creation. It doesn't explain the world. It doesn't explain where we're going and why we're going. Nah, science will take care of it. Don't worry. Our politicians will take good care of everything. Thing. Gina Rahimondo, <laughs> Tim McKee, you know, we have uh, Nelly Gorbea and a host of others, and those who are running for office, even worse, if you can imagine, than the people who are in, who are trying to make a more progressive society. Now, all of this is contrary to God. All of it is contrary to God's word. Well, what's the matter with all of us coming together and just loving one another? There's nothing, nothing wrong with all of us as humans, as people coming together as a race or a group of races on the earth, not killing each other, not warring against each other, not attacking each other, not hating each other. But there's a difference between that kind of tolerance and Satan's tolerance. Now, what do I mean by that? Satan is a very tolerant being. He tolerates all that should not be tolerated, <laughs> the intolerable, and he is intolerable of God. We know that. A child understands that Satan and God are two opposites. There's two forces in this world, the spirit of Satan and the force of God. Both are at war with each other. Both have children on the earth. Both are doing battle. What kind of battle? With tanks and guns and bombers and planes and helicopters? No! They're doing spiritual battle. As the Apostle Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Where? In the heavens, in high places. He's referring to this angelic conflict, cosmos diabolicus. That means Satan's world. There are forces that we're fighting all the time. We have angels, you know, many of us who have been attacked and, and uh, others try to take us down and so on and so forth. And we don't even know the many attempts that are made on us physically. And yet, God's angels, his messengers come out and they protect us in ways that we don't even know. Every time, and I know Satan is at work all the time trying to bring us down here. Constant. It's a constant battle from beginning to end. I could tell you the problems that we've had and the issues that we've had mechanically, electrically, and so forth, electronically. And you know what? God has always, always seen us through them because we have faith in Him, because we put Him first. In Matthew chapter 6, and this is what Jesus is saying after the Sermon on the Mount, He's saying, does not a lark just be a lark? Does not a butterfly be a butterfly? In so many words, he's telling us that even, even the very lilies of the field, God has placed there. And yet they are not arrayed as we are. 
as the angels who now are human beings in flesh and blood. God careth for you. He careth for us because he created us to be his own. In the book of Revelation, you know, we're told God created all things for his glory. Why? For his what? For his happiness, for his pleasure in Revelation chapter 4. We need to understand that. Otherwise, there's no point to this world, folks. There is no understanding as to why we are here and who we are. I used to sit up when I was growing up in bed at night and look at the stars and the galaxies. Maybe you've done the same thing. And uh, I used to say to myself, why are we here? What's out there? The constellations, you know, the, the heavens, the stars. What do they represent? Where do they come from? Where is this firmament? What is that all about? Now, of course, they wouldn't dare teach that in the public school system, in science class or any other class, not after 1962 and 3, when America changed and America became a declaration of evil, a declaring of a war against God in the schools, in our institutions. And now, of course, we're reaping the consequences of that. But you see, I used to say that, and I, I realized there was more to life than just this flesh and blood which if it's extinguished, it dies. Guess what? The soul lives on. How do I know that? Because God said it. That's why. He says, and in Luke chapter 16, Luke the great physician, he shows us that there is a gulf, as he says, a great divide, a gulf upon death. And in the book of Luke chapter 16, we read of the rich man, who died and was buried, and Lazarus, who was called a beggar, but he really wasn't a beggar in that sense. He was sickly. He had sores and illness all over his body. And one went one way and the other went the other way. Now guess which way they went? The rich man in hell, the Bible says, lifted up his eyes in torment and cried out, send me a drop of water to cool my burning tongue. Now, a lot of people get confused about hell because the word hell is translated from four different words, from the Hebrew to the, uh, the Greek. And one of them is Tartarus, and the other one is Gehenna, and so on and so forth. You say Hades as well, which is a, basically a burning garbage dump in Jerusalem. And, and all of this, again, is distorted by the preachers, by the church, who want you to think of this burning hell. Well, the hell does not exist until the very end of the book of Revelation, where God says that those who are not found written in his book of life shall be cast into the lake of fire. That's where the wicked go. All those who did not accept the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ. All those who hated him, who deprived him of the opportunity, who, who uh, uh, spit at him, who murdered him, who will not repent, they go right into the lake of fire. That's their fate. But when they die, when a soul dies now, where does it go? It's up to God, based on that person's faith, his understanding, her understanding of who and what Jesus Christ is. The good side and the bad side. You know, I think of, of people like, you know, some of the depositors of the credit unions um, that took place, the credit union debacle that was totally unnecessary and totally made worse by the Sunland administration. And I think of someone like a Sunland on one side of the Gulf, the rich man, begging for a drop of water to cool his tongue, awaiting the time when judgment comes. And those poor people who lost their money in the credit unions being closed by him, and the fact that they couldn't get their money, some died, some died in one particular of a heart attack, and poor in spirit, but actually rich in spirit. Poor in the wallet, but not in true spirit of God on the other side of the gulf. And now both can see each other. That's the amazing thing. They cannot cross that divide, it says in the Gospel of Luke chapter 16, the gulf. Evil on one side and good on the other. And now they can face each other. Isn't that amazing? See, there is a day of judgment, a day of God, a day of God's wrath, but also a day of God's deliverance for those who will, when given their chance, to understand the truth, the whole truth. And that'll come during the millennium, which comes after 
this earth age is over when Satan appears in Jerusalem and is taken down by Jesus. That will come. The choice is going to be theirs. Innocent ones, the little children, of course, who don't know any better, those who are infirmed, or those who are mentally disabled, have problems, they're not accountable. God is merciful, but he's also just. Remember, God is a God of love. But in order to love, you must hate. What do you mean by that? Well, how can you love your neighbor without hating your neighbor's enemies who, tr who try to steal them, break into their homes? kill them and so forth. You hate the evil, but you love the good. Well, God is a God of hate and a God of love. Two opposites in one. Makes sense, doesn't it? You bet it does. Now let's go back to studying the Word of God with Dr. Bertrand L. Compare and see exactly his brilliant teaching of years ago as a scholar and a legal scholar as well as a biblical scholar as to what this tree is all about, what genetics are all about, and who are God's chosen people, who is the real Jesus. Let's listen now and watch Dr. Compare for a few minutes. How can we have been misled into doing the stupid and evil things which our nation has been led to do by our stupid or corrupt leaders? I think we can trace this evil course back to a strange thing, the most curious masquerade in all history. And now I want to talk to you about the great masquerade. The whole Bible is the history of the conflict between our God and the rebel Satan, carried on between their children also. Didn't you know that they both had children? Yes, I do mean children, not merely followers. If you don't know this, you should read your Bible more carefully. Luke 3 verse 38 tells us that Adam was the son of God. And surely you know that Adam had children and descendants down through our own generation, right on down to ourselves. In many other places, God refers to his own children. For just a few of these, consider first Deuteronomy 32 verse 19. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them, because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. Again, Isaiah 43, verse 6. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the ends of the earth. In Isaiah 45, verse 11, we read, Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. In Psalm 82, verse 6, God says, I have said, Ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. In the New Testament, we read in John 11, verses 51 and 52, He prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he should gather together the children of God that were scattered abroad. And Paul in Romans 8 verses 14 and 16 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. As to the children of Satan, this also is affirmed in the Bible from beginning to end. First in Genesis 3 verse 15, where God tells Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. The same Hebrew word for seed or descendants is used in both instances. So Satan is to have just as literal seed or children as the woman Eve. Jesus Christ himself affirmed this several times. For example, in Matthew 13 verses 38 and 39 where he said, The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Note that. Not that they're just wicked people or followers of the wicked one. He says they are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. In John 6, verses 70 and 71, Jesus said to his twelve disciples, Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. And he spoke of Judas Iscariot. And Judas was the only Jew among the disciples. Again, very carefully, read the 8th chapter of John, beginning with verse 31, where Jesus said to these Jews, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. 
They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye should do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth which I have heard of God. Ye do the deeds of your father. They tried to masquerade as God's children, but they couldn't deceive him. They said, We have one father, even God. But Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Ye, now he's speaking to these Jews, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. It is my father that honors me, of whom ye say that he is your God, yet ye have not known him. Now Jesus was not just using vulgarly abusive language to them. He was stating a biological fact with scientific accuracy, just as if he had said to a Chinaman, your ancestors were Mongolians. The Apostle Paul also doesn't hesitate to identify Jews as the children of the devil. Meeting one in Acts 13, verses 6 to 10, Paul plainly called him, thou child of the devil, in the thousands of years of this conflict, whenever we've remembered that we are the children of God, and we've remained loyal to him, and remembered that God himself put enmity between his children and Satan's children, then we've had prosperity and high civilization with very little crime, and the wars which the wicked started against us ended quickly with tremendous victories in our favor. Satan's tactics have always been the same down through the ages. First he tries to crush us by force, as the Bible records many times, and as we saw a few years ago in Japan's treacherous attack upon us. But these attacks from outside always fail when we remember who we are and who they are and act accordingly. Then Satan tries another method. Since God has given us the victory whenever we remember that we are his children and will have nothing to do with the children and the ways of Satan, then Satan realizes the only way to conquer and enslave or destroy us is to make us forget this division between the children of God and the children of Satan and get us all mixed together so that our ways will be corrupted with theirs. Our children will learn their evil because they are integrated with their children. Our government will be controlled by their power and thereby they will make us enemies of God like themselves. Only when we are in rebellion against God and therefore do not receive his help, only then can Satan and his children hope to destroy us. We were warned of this as of all other dangers. In Deuteronomy 7, verses 2 to 4, we got the first warning. Thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and destroy thee suddenly. But we have allowed these Jews to enter our land in vast numbers. Multitudes of them were admitted illegally under the Roosevelt administration. We've allowed them to take control of our commerce, our government, our schools, and now these Jews who hate our God are even laying vile hands on our churches. God warned us not to allow them in the land, saying, For they will turn away thy son from following me. They have done this. Jewish organizations have made such a bitter fight against any mention of the name of Jesus Christ in our schools that many school boards have yielded to their pressure. They've sometimes been able to put some of their own Jewish people into public office where they have ruled officially that we cannot read even one verse from the Bible in our schools because it offends these enemies of God. Our children are not allowed to hear the name of God in our schools, and now even our churches are being infiltrated and corrupted in the same way under the guise of interfaith movements. Supposedly Christian ministers have been induced to bring into their pulpits rabbis whose official doctrine calls our Savior, Jesus Christ, a liar and a fraud. To avoid offending these people, supposedly Christian ministers now carefully avoid preaching anything from the Gospel of John. They practically deny their Savior to please his enemies. So our children, who cannot hear the name of our God in school, often cannot hear it in their churches either. The evil of which God warned us has come upon us.
How are Satan's Jewish children able to do this? By a great masquerade in which they pretended to be God's children and they've corrupted most of our clergymen until they no longer tell us who we are. We received warning of this also if we would only heed it. In 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 to 15 it says, Such men are sham apostles, dishonest workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, as even Satan himself masquerades as a shining angel. So it is nothing strange if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, but their doom will fit their actions. So we are told by these corrupted clergymen that these Jews are God's chosen, that they must be helped to invade and steal other people's lands, that our own institutions must be changed so as not to offend them, and that our churches must abandon Jesus Christ because these Jews hate his name, and we must abandon our Savior in order to have fellowship with them. But God warned us not to have fellowship with devils. All masquerades must reach an end, and this one is almost finished. Now to sum it all up, the Jews are not and never were any part of any tribe of Israel. They include various mixtures of Egyptian, Babylonian, and Canaanite peoples, the Edomites, and later also the Khazars. Jesus Christ was a pure-blooded Israelite of the tribe of Judah without any Jewish ancestry, and he was not a Jew by religion. Now think this over carefully. The group of nations which we loosely group under the term Anglo-Saxon, including the people of the British Isles, the Scandinavian nations, nearly all of Germany, Holland, some few of the people of France and Belgium, with the closely related people found in Austria, some of the Swiss, some of the Hungarians and North Italians, and their descendants now living in the United States, Canada, Australia, and South Africa. These people are the living descendants of the Israel of the Bible, blood brothers of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Aren't you proud of your ancestry? Well, again, folks, pretty hard-hitting, isn't it? To study the Word of God plainly, openly, and without any confounding in the mind. That battle I told you about is in the mind. The media are corrupt. The media are controlled by the synagogue of Satan in Jerusalem, in New York, in Paris, in London. All of these bankster, gangster, criminal banking houses that control the CIA, the FBI, they control the New York Times, or should I say the New York Slime, and the Washington Toast, Jeff Bezos, Amazon. All of this is a battle for your mind, and you don't realize it. Now, our people, God said, are a little soddish. They're a little stupid in the mind. They, they fall for every hoax that comes down the pike. I don't care what it is, the whole hoax, the evolution hoax, the, the global warming hoax, or any other hoax for that matter. They all believe the Martians were coming and invaded the Earth in War of the Worlds in 1938. Orson Welles did it. And you know, folks, people were literally killing themselves because they believed it was possible. Now, how can you believe it's possible? You have to be deceived in the mind. You have to let the media, the corrupt media, do your thinking. And even the alternative media, the so-called alt-right and the Steve Bannon types, will deceive you too. So how do you know what's true and what's not true, you say? Well, how? You listening? You listening? Right here. The Word of God is applied to every issue that we face today in the world. Every issue. No, it doesn't say don't buy that VCR or don't run that DVD because it's porn or what have you. But it tells us what to eschew, what to hate. We hate that which is contrary to God. We do the sins. Yes, we all sin. But those who are righteous with God repent of their sins and accept, accept forgiveness, okay? Because God is faithful and just to forgive sins of all who confess them in sincerity and ask for his forgiving. He wouldn't be God if he didn't, you see. So, Dr. Compare makes a lot of sense. Now, if you are open-minded and you want to hear truth, you will say, where are our teachers today? Where are these pastors, these Bible-believing teachers? They're nowhere to be found. Oh, they have huge buildings, huge edifices, and they don't even own them, not a brick in them. 
They're still paying off the mortgage, the debt, the loans. And you know what? As people are losing their jobs in Rhode Island, they're losing their homes. And guess what? The money flow is not there like it used to be. I'm sorry, but that's reality. Catholic churches are closing and consolidating because they can't afford it. You know why? They're not teaching God's Word. I don't care, Catholic, Protestant, in between, it doesn't matter. In the book of Amos, chapter 8, verse 11, we're told that the famine for the end times will be what? A famine for hearing the Word of God. Not of bread, not of food, not of eateries. There'll be plenty of eateries. Be expensive. Food prices will be rising soon, but you know what? The real famine is here in the heart. Why? Why is that so? You go to church and you come out saying, wasn't that nice, but you're empty inside. You're saying to yourself, I don't feel like I've been fed. Not enough, not enough of the food. I'm starving. And Sally's saying that to Johnny, and Johnny's saying that to Sally, and they don't feel satisfied. They think they do. But then when they reflect upon it, and then they watch programs like this and say, why haven't we been taught that? I can't answer for you except to tell you the theological cemeteries, uh, uh, seminaries uh, are teaching a lot of fluff, a lot of lies, and they're not teaching the Word of God. Why? Because one of the hidden dynasties spoken of in the book of Zechariah, chapter 1, verse 18, okay, we'll get to it in subsequent programs, tells us there are horns, the four horns, the powers of this world system. One of them is, and most importantly, the churches, the religious world. They're captive. Of whom? Of the synagogue of Satan. Schofield was one of them. Cyrus Ingerson Schofield. Darby was another. Even uh, Margaret MacDonald, who saw this rapture coming to take the church away. All of them have been deceivers and deceived. You don't want to go there. You don't want to find yourself in that captivity. If you are, come out. Get into the Word. Come out of the churches. Have fellowship with God, with Him. Commune with Him daily in the name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Now, folks, thank you for being with us again today. Watch our program on public access television, as you will see here on the screen, and also the YouTube channel, The Deadly Experiment. Rick Adams also on republicbroadcasting.org, where we do a Saturday show from 2 p.m. to 4 Eastern time. And folks, it's getting livelier and livelier as we approach the very last days of this age. Thank you, and uh, I want to thank all of you for studying God's Word, who do. And remember, we give grace and thanks, and we love the mercies of the Father in heaven, for it is He that counts. May He, Yahweh, bless His elect. 